Hey, welcome. We've been talking through some crucial ideas in a physics course throughout the year, the major ideas for the course, and right now we're in the middle of a vibrations and waves unit. And so today we want to talk about something really vitally important for vibrations and waves, and that is the fundamental difference between a transverse wave and a longitudinal wave. Not only that, there are parts and also how to solve a problem using the wave equation and what all that means. So let's go ahead and get to it. I want you to please focus on these two animations here for a moment. The left is a transverse wave example. The right is a longitudinal or a compressional wave example. And I want you to think about what is different about these two waves. What fundamentally is different about these two waves? Well, one way to think about this is to think about, well, let's compare the direction of the wave itself to the direction of the motion of the medium of the waves. A medium of a wave has to do with the thing or absence of a thing that a wave travels through. So a medium could be air, could be water. Waves travel through water. They actually travel through the earth as well. It could even travel through nothing at all, which is what space is mostly made of, just a whole lot of nothing. And so waves will travel through these things, all right? So let's focus first on what the direction of the wave is. Is the direction of the wave in both cases the same direction or different directions? What do you think? Well, it's going to be the same direction, right? Both examples have a direction of the wave from left to right. Well, what about the direction of the medium compared to the direction of the wave itself? So what's the medium doing compared to the direction of the wave itself? I will say at the outset, this transverse wave, if you've ever done the wave at a sporting event, you stand up in your chair and you sit down as the wave passes throughout the stadium. You're engaging in a collective transverse wave, you could say, right? Are these going to be the same in terms of the direction and the motion of the medium of these waves? What do you guys think? And the answer is no, they're not going to be the same. So check this out. The direction of the motion of the medium for the wave on the left is going to be perpendicular to the direction of the wave itself. Whereas the direction of the motion of the medium is going to be in the same plane as the direction of the wave itself over here. So this is moving in this plane right here and the direction of the wave itself is in that direction as well. I do want to say at the outset, we're going to say a lot more about this later, but visible light is the most famous and important example of a transverse wave. So we'll be talking about that in more detail as the course goes on. For now though, I do want to throw out another example like, hey, where have I experienced a longitudinal or a compressional wave before? Well, anytime you hear sound, you are interacting with a compressional or a longitudinal wave because sound is a type of this wave probably for our purposes it's the most important example of what we're talking about and so please keep that in mind as we talk about these two different types of waves in fact I'm going to keep these images here to help you to remember all right this is how light behaves like this as a transverse wave and sound behaves like this as a longitudinal or a compressional wave all right, and there are some parts that we need to talk about, parts to a transverse wave, let's say. So first off, we do need to define that we're going to call this a trough. It's a crest up here. Here's another crest. Here's another crest. Here's one trough. Here's another trough over here. And we do have something called a wavelength. And a wavelength is going to be measured like all lengths are in meters or some metric variation of meters. And that's going to be the distance between, say, one trough to the next trough or one crest to the next crest, you could say. I will say that's the easiest way to measure what a wavelength is between one trough and the next trough or one crest and the next crest. I will say it gets a little tricky, though, because sometimes students want to measure what the wavelength is right over here. And they say that is one wavelength. Do you agree? Is that going to be one wavelength right here? And the answer is no. Hopefully you can see that. Just visually compare, oh, if we said that's a wavelength here, that's a wavelength here. How much of a wavelength is this? Well, that's going to be one half of a wavelength. If you have trouble with that, that's okay. I do want to point out the differences here. So, like I said, the easiest way to do this is just to pick one crest to the next crest or one trough to the next trough. That's the easiest way. But if you want to pick something right at the equilibrium position, you have to think about not only the position that the wave is in, but what it is doing. In this case, it's moving downward, so to speak, and it's moving upward, so to speak, at this. You want to repeat the cycle. So a wavelength is the distance for the wave to repeat an entire cycle, you could say. 
And that's true from one trough to the next trough or one crust to the next crust. But that would take two equilibrium positions. In other words, if I back up over here, this is going down in the middle. This is going up in the middle. The next time it's going down in the middle is over here. So if I measured from this end point to this point over here, then I could say we could measure the wavelength from the equilibrium or center axis line. But I will say it is a common mistake that students make when they measure the wavelength. If they measure it like this and they think that this is the wavelength right here, they're actually measuring half the wavelength. And then they end up getting the problem or the lab wrong. All right, next up, let's talk about parts of a longitudinal or a compressional wave. So if we have the direction of the wave itself is to the right, we do have a compression. It's going to be moving through this. So this is like step one, step two, and step three down here. So I've tried to draw like a slinky. If you've ever seen a wave move through a slinky, that's a compressional or a longitudinal wave. One part of this type of wave is a compression right here. So you can see the compression here, compression here. And that's immediately followed by something called a rarefaction right here, where the medium is stretched out. And you can see that in the animation over here. So you have a compression followed by a rarefaction, and then it settles down. Now this is a wave pulse, so it's a one-time wave that travels through a medium, you could say. It's not like a standing wave or something like that. And so just to be clear, this over here is kind of like a longitudinal or compressional wave version of a crust over here. It's kind of like the compressional version of a crust, you could say, whereas this is sort of like the compressional or longitudinal version of a trough, you could say. That analogy holds true. And then one last thing I could say, if you wanted to measure a wavelength, this is less common working with longitudinal or compressional waves for this kind of thing. But if you wanted to measure the wavelength here, you could measure from the same part in the cycle to the next same part of the cycle and just use those compressions here and that would give you the wavelength remember if you're not sure what the wavelength is just think of the word length it's going to be measured similarly so it's going to be measured in meters or centimeters or something along those lines all right real quick i do want to throw out the wave speed equation so i would argue this is the most important equation for this entire unit of vibrations and waves and so let's Bring it back to something you're familiar with too. So you're familiar with radio stations. You've tuned into radio stations your entire life and you can now understand more about what this means. So like Jack FM up in the greater Seattle area has a frequency of 96.5. What does that mean? Well, that's 96.5 megahertz. That's its frequency that it's being broadcast at. Mega is like times a million or times 10 to the 6, you could say. So it's a very large number. And we know the radio waves are sent out from the station, have a wavelength. By the way, this lambda over here represents wavelength, you could say. And that's 3.109 meters. Think about that for a moment. So a realistic wavelength for a radio station is about 10 feet. If you can imagine that, that will help you to internalize this knowledge and think about what all that means. So the question we have is, what is the speed of the radio waves? Well, it's really pretty easy to work with this equation here. I would rewrite this down here, but I don't have enough room. So I'm going to go ahead and just plug in my numbers because it's already isolated from my unknown. My unknown is the speed, the wave speed. So I go ahead and multiply the frequency times the wavelength here. I've shown this in two different ways so you can get the idea of what we mean by hertz. I've gone over this in a previous lesson. If you want to see that, I'll put a link in the upper right. But I will say that hertz is cycles per second with the caveat, the idea that we don't have to cancel out cycles. So we can end up with meters per second. And that would make sense if we're trying to solve for a speed. And so you just continue with the problem. It turns out to be 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's a very special number that we're going to come back to. That is the speed of light, and that is the speed at which radio waves travel around our country. It's also the speed at which light travels, and I'll let you think about what that means. I'll explain what that means later on, but in any case, I hope this has been helpful. If you have any comments, let me know down below, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.